Okay, we're ready for the last hour. Someone should keep track of time. How long before I, I get my warning message? Is it every 10 minutes? I don't really know. I fixed this last night and it, it lasted about two hours before it appears, but now it comes back every so often. Sorry. Well, now this is more fun for me. We're going to begin to talk about getting closer to applications. And I want to begin by telling you a bit of a story about the, uh, the, the evolution of tunable diode laser absorption for aeropropulsion problems. I'll also talk a little bit about, I'm going to tell you about fundamentals, strategies, detectors, and some example applications in combustion aerospace and some future trends. So this uh, next hour is kind of a propulsion dimension, and then uh, the first lecture tomorrow will be on, on um, energy applications. So this is, uh, this is fun for me because I've been involved with this uh, subject for quite a while. Looks like, okay, so I'll start here for a second. Okay, so uh, when I was still a researcher doing my own experiments, I uh, did some experiments in a shock tube with a tunable diode laser that was a lead salt diode laser back around 1977. So, um, the Air Force was trying to uh, recognize the evolution of this technique into, uh, eventually into flight. So I call this uh, 35 years from, from a laboratory to flight. So I did my first experiments in 1977, trying to show the power of uh, wavelength tuned laser absorption, infrared, in high temperature gases. And uh, then there was a bit of a gap as we waited for room temperature. This was a liquid... Uh, Cryogenically cooled laser, pretty expensive, not very portable. But then about 1989, there became available room temperature diode lasers from the telecom industry. And we learned how to begin to measure with oxygen and to, to measure mass flux for engines. A little bit later, it became possible to measure other species like water and temperature and momentum flux uh, for thrust. Um, gradually, we did combustion control showing we could use laser absorption for, com for controlling combustion in real time. Uh, we learned how to measure some additional species. Uh, so gradually what happened is we went from just a limited laser to many, able to, ability to measure many species. Um, and then gradually from around 1996 to the present, we saw a rapid growth in applications to everything from arc jets, uh, hypersonic flow. Here's an example of uh, some measurements in a hypersonic facility, Mach 16 in uh, New York. Gas turbine engines, um, a lot of different things. And then more recently, applications in, in uh, other engines like scramjet combustors at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, commercial aircraft uh, engines, IC engines, detonation engines, so on. So basically, it's taken about 35 years, but the real highlight was in about 2012, of uh, this idea was flown in the scramjet to measure uh, properties inside a, a flight vehicle. So it's 35 years. Sometimes it takes a long time to go from an idea to the lab through the laboratory and to eventually, because flight deck tests are really complicated. But along the way, I had this vision, and I talked about this briefly before, that I imagined that we would take a family of lasers with different colors propagated by optical fibers to probe of some sort of a flight vehicle or a ground test vehicle where we would look for properties such as velocity and the mass flux and the species and temperature, combustor measurements and the exhaust measurements, including a thrust. So that was my idea, and uh, we've worked in that direction for a long time. Gradually, we've learned how to measure a lot of different properties, temperature, velocity, different, many different species. Uh, we've tested these ideas at Stanford, and we've taken them into various ground test facilities, and now they're adopted by many research groups around the world. And gradually, I think we'll see them for use in practical applications such as flight research and maybe even flight control. Okay, so now what are the fundamentals that we need to think about? Um, okay, oh, there we go. So basically, uh, the simple uh, picture is that we have a laser source of intensity I0 that passes across a duct of length L. And we measure the fractional transmission of light tau and we imagine we scan across an individual absorption line and we see something like this. So we're going to do spectrally resolved line of sight absorption spectroscopy. This could be in the UV, the IR, could be anywhere. Most often it's in the infrared. That's called scanned wavelength line of sight direct absorption. It's governed by the, the Beer-Lambert law because it's monochromatic light. 
so that any frequency nu, we have the exponential decay law, which we would either write in terms of k nu, as we've been doing for the last uh, several lectures, or we might write it in terms of a cross-section. They're both exponential decay laws. We typically go to the cross-section model if the pressures are high enough that the lines overlap, or if we're dealing with a large molecule that has uh, broad features rather than discrete features. Small molecules, we tend to do it uh, this way. Big molecules, we tend to do it this way. So this is what I've been talking about. If we do discrete spectra, we think of this as the product of the line strength and the line shape function, the mole fraction, and the static pr total static pressure. So that's the method we would use for small molecules. Big molecules or high pressures, we would go to this cross-section model where we would actually measure the cross-sections rather than uh, calculate them through the fundamentals. And frequently we would use, um, or in the infrared, we frequently would attempt to use HITRAN. And then we would, uh, would try to decide if HITRAN is okay if it has to be improved. HITRAN lists the positions of the lines, and it gives you reference line strengths at a, at a reference temperature, and it gives you some broadening information, but it does not give broadening information for high temperatures. So we almost always have to do laboratory studies to develop the database that we need to do quantitative absorption. Okay, so we can measure velocity as well by taking this light beam and passing it through the flow. Oh, here we go, I'll bet. Device enrollment. Oh dear, okay. I just don't understand this. Except that it's coming back for more and more often. I turn it off at night and cycle it and it seems to go away. So we, we use this and then, um, I know I have to put my light here. Okay. Okay, sorry, going back. I guess we were here. Okay. So the idea is that uh, we can bring the light beam through at different orientations, and each one of those would experience a different um, position for the line in, in terms of frequency space. And we can look at that and measure that through the Doppler shift the path averaged velocity uh, difference between those two beams. So one of those beams is is, uh, oh, there we go. Now, if you want to measure temperature, the most common thing to do is to use two colors of the same species and then look at the intensities of these two lines. Remember, if we integrate over the line, we just have the line strengths, and the re relative line strengths depend only really on the Boltzmann fraction, so we can get at that uh, pretty easily. As we learned how to measure more and more, uh, more and more convenient to use multiple colors, we'll use what we call wavelength multiplexing. So we look at several colors at once, several lines, and that we can then use this information for, um, to monitor multiple species or multiple parameters. So more information, more, more, uh, more measurements leads to more information. We also can look at the issue of whether or not it's uniform along the line of sight. So by combining enough different colors, each with a different dependence on, on uh, temperature and mole fraction, you can, affect, you can to some degree, uh, analyze the non-uniformities along that line. Otherwise, you're getting a path average. Okay, there's two primary strategies that we use, and the first one is called scan direct absorption. So we would have a, a gas sample, and we would modulate the laser wavelength by using some sort of a current function. It could be a sawtooth, it could be a sine wave, but you use current to modulate the wavelength of light, and as you scan the wavelength, you, there's a simultaneous increase in intensity. So fortunately or unfortunately, depends, uh, you get a gradual variation in intensity as well as uh, wavelength. And now this is a case where you see an absorption line. And if you fit the, the so-called baseline, the, the zero absorption line, and apply Beer's law, you end up with the um, absorbance. And that's the quantity that we care about. Now this is, the virtue of this is that it's simple, it's almost foolproof if the absorption feature is strong enough that you can get a clear signal. Because the problem is how well can you define the zero absorption baseline? And that can be a problem if you have small absorption. There's another variation that we use, it's called wavelength modulation spectroscopy. And in this case, we superpose a higher frequency uh, uh, modulation of current at a frequency f on top of this scan. So the gas uh, sample then is exposed to a laser which has got uh, a rapidly modulating uh, frequency and it looks like this on the detector. And so now we can ask 
a different question. We can send the signal to a to the computer and ask what is the uh, do a Fourier analysis and ask what is the signal as we scan in wavelength what is the signal uh, at the, for the one F component and the two F component and this is a plot of the two F component which roughly speaking is the second derivative of this function roughly speaking it has the advantage that it's zero in the wings so you have a way of looking of, of finding essentially the baseline that turns out to be a very powerful idea when the absorption is weak. So it's more sensitive, maybe it can be a factor of 10 or 50, a larger uh, signal-noise ratio, and especially useful when the absorption is weak. So the first method is, is uh, almost foolproof uh, if the absorption is strong enough. The second method is sometimes necessary, but it turns out that because you're looking now only at uh, high frequencies F and higher, you reject low frequency noise. So that turns out to be a powerful advantage of this scheme. So WMS with tunable diode lasers can improve noise rejection. We learned along the way something that other people had found years before. It took us a while to find the same issue. Uh, this happens sometimes, you have your own discovery and then you realize somebody else thought of this before. But if we take the ratio of the 2F signal and we divide it by the 1F signal, which is the absolute slope of this line, you, you remove the dependence on the laser intensity itself. And that means that you can use this to cancel out scattering losses in, a, in an experiment. And I'm going to show you how this works. And this is a really powerful idea. So we did an experiment. Um, someone is here from uh, Colorado. Somebody here from Colorado. I think one of Greg Ricker's. Anyway, Greg Ricker was my student who did this. He's a professor at Colorado now. So he took this modulated laser and he passed it through a, a lens. We call this the pitch side. It's the catch side. It was open air. This was a length of about a foot. There was about 6% absorbance for the water vapor line we were studying, just in room air. And we were looking at this, uh, this, this uh, scheme of, of 2F over 1F. And this is what happens if you pass a knife edge across this beam kind of gradually. You block the beam, the 2F beam, and you block the 1F beam because they're both proportional to intensity. But when you take the ratio, it's constant. So that's a powerful idea. That says that the possibility of if your windows are getting dirty with time, if particles are entering into the flow with time, the 2F over 1F ratio eliminates this problem. And that means you can work in a, in a flow that has particles with scattering loss. That's a really powerful idea. Did the same experiment, except now he just pounded on the table with a hammer. And you basically see that the 2F signal is modulated, the 1F is modulated, but the ratio is constant. So that's a very powerful idea. That's a big advantage of the WMS, normalized WMS method. It avoids uh, scattering lo uh, effects. It, uh, it eliminates low frequency noise. But it does have complications. It's more complicated. I like to say it's maybe 10 times more sensitive, and it's probably 10 times more complicated, which means more potential for making mistakes. But we use it a lot. We use it when we have issues about uh, window fouling, particulate scattering, or we have very small signals. And we've learned how to, how to do this over a wide range of conditions. Since the 2F signal is sensitive, second derivative of the absorbance, it's very sensitive to line shape. In order to do two, quantitative 2F, you need to understand how line shape varies near the peak. So you have to have a strong understanding of, uh, of, um, of line shapes. But we've learned ways to, to deal with this by doing scanned normalized WMS, which then cancels out this influence of, of uh, uncertain line strength. OK, so what species can we access? So we're mostly working in the, in the visible uh, out into the infrared. And so this is a bit of an old picture. It only goes between 1 micron and 6. This would be the visible ends at about 700 nanometers. This is the near infrared in here. This is kind of the mid-infrared in here. But if you look for species like nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, CO2, H2O, the vertical coordinate is the strength of the transitions. This looks like a solid band, but in fact, if you blow this up, all these individual lines, of which there's thousands, are spectrally separated if the pressure is uh, modest. What you see right away is that these bands here, now after this short course, you'll know what this is. This is the fundamental of CO. That's the, first, that's the first overtone. That's the second overtone. This one's 100 times weaker than this one. This one's 100 times weaker than this one. So if you want to measure CO, work here. 
But it's not been easy to work here because only gradually over time do the lasers work their way out. So gradually over time, we're getting better and better at this. Now we make measurements of CO2 here and here, CO here, NO here. Water is everywhere. That's a plus and a minus. The good news is there's always, almost always a water vapor line to use. The bad news is there's almost always a water vapor line in the way. <laughs> so you have to work with that. Hydrocarbons all absorb at around 3.4 microns. And so, but now there's a very um, broad features and we use cross-section models when we do this. So for small molecules like these, we use the discrete structure that we can get out of HITRAN or our own databases. We have our own databases. When we study water at high temperatures, we find that the HITRAN has got some deficiencies. And in particular, we have to measure the broadening coefficients and the shift coefficients for ourselves. So there's always a lot of background spectroscopy to make this really quantitative. Although once that's known, someone else can copy it if they wish. Large molecules, we use a little different structure. They have blended features. We have to use some different strategies here to deal with this. Uh, you can measure the absorption at a fixed wavelength, but it's harder to do WMS. Okay, where are lasers available? So uh, this slide is a few years old, but basically uh, at the shorter wavelengths out to say 1.8 microns or so, pretty mature, you can essentially buy lasers at almost any color. Gradually over time, this gets better and better and better. The details of these lasers uh, is, uh, vary. Because of these lasers, it's really a materials problem. You have to use different materials to get emission in different uh, wavelength ranges. So these, this is alphabet soup. QC is quantum cascade. Uh, at the time, we were using different frequency generations, so that's another strategy. Um, so the, the types of lasers change, but all we think, of, just think of them as uh, tunable monochromatic sources. Here's some species that, that are absorbed. So you'll notice here we do not see, you do not see nitrogen. There's no molecular nitrogen. There's no molecular hydrogen. A real challenge in, in uh, diagnost optical diagnostics is how do you measure hydrogen? You'd like to measure molecular hydrogen. But we can measure a lot of species. We can measure a lot of species that are not accessible with laser-reduced fluorescence. So you'll notice in laser-reduced fluorescence there's kind of a small number of species that people use. So the infrared is uh, called the, the fingerprint region uh, provides access to a lot of different species. So I've got students measuring atoms, which happen to be invisible, as well as all of these other species. The nice thing about some of these lasers is that they can be fiber coupled, and so if it's possible to, they're very compact. I don't know if that's a nickel or a dime, it could be a dime. <coughs> they're very compact, and they can be connected with optical fiber so that you can locate the laser, pump the light through a fiber, and bring it to a remote location with a minimum of, uh, with a readily. Keep the lasers in a place where it's uh, safer and, war and cooler or, or maybe hotter. Gradually over time then they're getting more and more available out here. When they first are available they're expensive and over time if there's enough uh, uh, market the prices come down. So let's look a little bit at uh, hardware then. Uh, let's look at, uh, so these lasers are essentially semiconductor or solid state devices. Um, they're available from the near UV, from the UV, that'd be called the near UV, uh, out to the far infrared. I think we have lasers that work out at around 11 microns. We had a laser that worked at about 400 nanometers. We don't have it right now. Power level for the CW continuous wave lasers tends to be milliwatts or up to maybe in some cases 100 milliwatts for CW laser systems. So the low power uh, is fine for absorption experiments. It's not enough for some cases where you'd like to have high intensities to generate, say, a Raman signal. Prices are anything from typically in the thousands of dollars. Of course, you've got the laser, then you have to have uh, uh, power supplies and computers and temperature devices, controllers, and so, you know, the system might end up costing ten, twenty thousand dollars QC lasers, quantum cascades, which is the, has been the best way to get out to the further end of the mid infrared, you might have to pay $40,000 for a laser system. It has some advantages, but they're expensive. So in the near infrared, it's uh, easier to do fiber coupling. Gradually over time, there's uh, uh, materials people working on fibers that work in the, in the mid infrared. And that's uh, gradually evolving over time. I guess we have been out to 2.3 microns with uh, solid core fibers, and we've been out to 10 microns with hollow core fibers. So it's possible 
but uh, the fibers tend to be um, more sensitive and uh, fragile if you go to longer wavelengths. Detectors, so you, uh, just like we have different structures and types for lasers at different wavelength regions, it's a materials problem, same thing applies for detectors. Uh, there's a variety of different detector materials. Common in the infrared is indium antimonide or shorter wavelengths, um, indium arsenide. Um, we use a lot of indium antimonide detectors all the way out to about five microns. If you want to go to longer wavelengths, you use something called mercury cadmium telluride or mercad telluride. They tend to be cooled because cooling improves the performance the, uh, of, the, of the detectors. This is just a quick look at the wavelength range you can get for, and I go fast over this because you have these notes available to if you want them, and, and it's in the literature. So there's the, um, for different, uh, as a function of wavelength, there's the response region of, of different uh, detectors. Then there's the question of bandwidth. So how fast do you want your detector to be? Do you want to resolve a nanosecond? Do you want to resolve uh, microseconds? Do you want to resolve milliseconds? So there's an effective uh, bandwidth that you have to think about. And here's the approximately the maximum bandwidth. Here's the megahertz. So most of these detectors are capable of uh, megahertz or higher. Uh, lead, lead sulfide is slower for some reason. Um, some of these photomultipliers, of course, can go very fast and have high bandwidth of uh, gigahertz or so if you need it. There's a price you pay when you have, uh, did I go to, did I pass over one? Yeah, there's a price you pay uh, when you, I'll go up here, that'll definitely, that'll probably trigger the, the warning. Um, there's a quantity called D-star, which is one way that detectors are characterized. It's a number. You'd look it up and you'd find that, that you want the big number. And you'd find that that number improves if you cool it. Why? Because you're reducing certain types of noise. And this D-star is related to the area of the detector and the bandwidth that you're using and then the noise equivalent power. So you might say, I want to be able to detect a very small amount of power. You want a high NEP. So you're going to get, uh, excuse me, you want a low NEP. I said it backwards. You want a low NEP and that corresponds to a high D-star. So you want to buy a detector that has a high D-star and the price will go up if you buy one that's uh, cooled and has a high D star. So look at it another way. If you want to uh, look at the signal noise ratio that you're going to see on your detector in the presence of uh, laser light, it'd be uh, dependent on the incident power divided by the noise equivalent power. Or if I write this in terms of my D star, it would look like this. So my signal noise ratio goes up with D star. It goes down with increasing bandwidth or increasing area of the detector. So this is a scaling relation that you might uh, need to worry about. When do you have to worry about it? You have to worry about it when the laser power is low. Higher the laser power, the more photons, and, and uh, you can drive up here. You can drive up the signal noise ratio for the fixed NEP. OK, so uh, I'm going to go through three examples uh, talking about the benefits of the near infrared for relative to Longer wavelengths are better for CO2. I'm going to show you this progression for temperature measurement. So I'm going to show the benefits of uh, working further out in wavelength, how we can measure temperature, and then the benefit of doing the WMS method in the next few slides. So this is a blown up view of the CO2 slide I showed you earlier, uh, labeled with the notation. So now you know what this notation means. So what is this? Yeah, let's look at one that's simpler. This region right here is nu1 plus nu3. That's a combination band, where you're seeing transitions that have a delta a V of 1 for both the asymmetric stretch and the symmetric stretch. Remember, the symmetric stretch, nu1, does not absorb light. So this is just the labeling that goes on, and there's some labels that are missing. But the main thing is, um, here is a much better place to be than here, much better place than here. You can see the scaling factor here. So this, and we do this at a fixed temperature because temperature determines the populations that are active in absorption. So you get a different picture if I did this at 300 degrees. So we'd like to work our way out this way, which is what we've been doing for the last 10 or 20 years. Now, temperature is very important in combustion. So we're going to try to measure temperature using line ratios. And the question is, well, what transition shall we use? So if we want to work here because we want strong absorption, 
And uh, this group of lines is the so-called 2 nu 2 plus nu 3. So we're looking at combined, so remember now, this, this combination of energy change is wavelength. That's the energy of the photon. So wavelength is converted to energy and it's distributed over multiple modes of the molecule. So we want to be out here because these are stronger. So we have to pick lines in this band. So there's the picture of that band. Here's a blown up picture of that band. So once you blow it up, now we have a much finer scale. And now we're seeing that these lines are isolated. And we're seeing terminology that you now understand. That's the R28 line. That means that you're going from V, double, v, v equals zero for the, all, the, all the modes, all the way up to the prescribed quanta, uh, two changes in nu2. And so you're going from zero, zero up to one of these and two of these. And you're doing that by going from J of 28. And the blue is the line for 650 Kelvin, and the red is the line for 1200 Kelvin. So what do you see? For R28, the absorption, absorbance goes down. So this is for 1% CO2 and a path length of 10 centimeters. And this absorbance means that you're getting about 15% absorption in that path length. If I double the path length, I get double the absorbance. But when I go from 650 to 1200, the absorbance at line center goes down by about a factor of three or four. But by contrast, if I go out to a high J, J of 70, when the temperature's going up, the uh, fractional, Boltzmann fraction's gonna go up. And so here's one where the signal goes up with T. So that looks like in a good place to take the ratio to get T. So we would pick, and these are both fairly close together. They're separated by 12 wave numbers. So we could have a laser here and a laser here and take the ratio of the absorption and it would be strongly temperature sensitive. So we've used this particular pair quite a bit. And it turns out that they're also independent. These are a pair that's free of water and they have a wide separation in E double prime that I showed you was the way to get temperature sensitivity. Now I just want to show you one example of how we've used this uh, and how well it can work when everything is working right. So we use a shock tube, and we'll come back to shock tubes a little bit later in the, in the course. So we have the shock tube, and uh, we provide a shock wave, reflects, and it leaves behind a static sample. And we probe this region here where we think we know the temperature to about 1% or better. And we want to validate our, our strategy. Now, this is, uh, looks a little complicated. Here's the, the round cross section of the shock tube. And here's the light at 2743 nanometers, which is one of those two lines passing through this way. And then at the same cross section, we have the, the red beam at 2752. So when, when the wavelength is a little bit longer, you call it to the red. When the wavelength is a little shorter, you call it to the blue. So this is the blue beam, this is the red beam. Uh, they both are uh, modulated at high frequency, 100 kilohertz. That's F in the WMS scheme. And then we can do the analysis and we get a data point about every 25 microseconds, 40 kilohertz. So we're really measuring the temperature by the ratio and the absolute level of CO2. So what you care about is how sensitive is this to temperature. Here's the ratio of the 2F signals, which by the way depend upon the amplitude of modulation. I haven't talked about that. The amplitude of modulation. Uh, which is related to line shape. So here's the ratio as a function of temperature. And what this is, and this is for two different pressures. It just shows that it's independent of pressure. And what you care about is the slope of this line. How sensitive is it? You want this slope to be steep in order to get the most sensitive temperature measurement. So the ratio is sensitive to temperature. We pick lines that are highly sensitive to temperature. You also pick lines that give you a sufficient absorption. So you're constrained by wanting to have enough absorption and, and not too much absorption. So you might want at least 5% absorption in one beam and less than, say, 70% absorption in the, in the other beam to keep it best. So how well can this work? So this is an experiment in which we measure temperature versus time. So look, the pressure signal is shown here in blue. So the arrival of the, re of the incident shock and reflected shock is right here, and then the pressure remains constant for about eight or nine milliseconds. So the pressure is on the right in blue. 
we expect that the temperature should follow this rather pre precisely. So now here's the temperature that we get on the left hand. And this temperature is about 950 or so Kelvin. And what we're looking for is how constant is this and how accurately or precise can we infer the temperature if we blow this up. If we blow this up and look at this signal over here, after an initial transient, we see that the measured temperature stays constant with an RMS variation of about three degrees. I don't think anybody, certainly not in the shock to world, has ever measured temperature this precisely. That's precision, not necessarily accuracy. But the accuracy is confirmed by saying that these two agree within their combined uncertainties. So that's, uh, now that's a good day. It doesn't always work that well. <laughs> so this is real time, this is a unique capability for measuring the temperature in a reactive environment that's uniform along the line of sight. But now I want to show you how well this works if we look at a scattering medium. Let's look at a problem in which we have uh, what I call an aerosol shock tube. So we have a shock tube that's now filled with, uh, well, there's a little bit of CO2 we need, but there's a, a mist of endodecane. Mist of these droplets are probably three to five microns inside, and we have a cloud of them. The path length is 10 centimeters. Pressure is about behind the instant shock wave is half an atmosphere. Reflected shock is about one and a half. So now let's look versus time. The, the droplet extinction, that's the scattering that we observe, uh, is shown here. But we've used the 2F over 1F to eliminate the, I'm calling this extinction, but it's really the signal that we see from the molecules only. So we see the signal here, and then we see a jump in the, uh, in the attenuation. Why is that? That's the density increase the shock across the instant shock wave. And then we see a decline. And this blue signal, here's the reflected shock. The blue signal is zero. What does that mean? That means we have effectively eliminated the droplets, but it also means that we have watched um, the signal decay. If you look at the temperature, we see it jump up here, and then the temperature drops. Why does the temperature drop? The droplets are evaporating. So we've just studied, just measured, the evaporation of these droplets. So we've measured the temperature change that takes place during the evaporation, and we've shown that the 2F over 1F method allows us to discriminate, get the signal of the gas by itself. And we can confirm that by saying that our signal goes to zero when the droplets go away. So we're measuring the removal of the droplets, uh, that we're measuring really the, the, uh, the extinction from the droplets here. So that's the power of the 2F over 1F uh, method in an aerosol. And I'm gonna show you tom uh, tomorrow how we've done this uh, in a lot of different uh, coal, combustor coal combustors. Well, some people would care about IC engines, so let's see what we can do with an IC engine. Looks like I'm not going to show you the IC engines. Somehow I disconnected my slides. Okay. Gee, I lost a slide. What should be here is that we would use uh, absorption at uh, three microns to measure uh, inside an IC engine the evaporation of fuel and the combustion take place. Looks like I've lost the slide. I apologize for that. Basically, I wanted to show you an IC engine. Looks like I dropped it out. Sorry. OK, I want to go to some um, aerospace applications, looking at subsonic velocity at Stanford, uh, supersonic velocity at NASA Langley, supersonic combustion at University of Virginia, looking at some different ideas. So I talked uh, before about uh, taking the laser beam two different colors and passing it through the flow at two different directions. The idea being that this beam that's going this way, the flow's coming this way. So this beam sees, um, this, this flow sees an increasing frequency, but from this beam it sees a decreasing frequency. And we only have to measure the difference in the frequency peaks to get the velocity, depending upon this angle. So this is a two color scheme to try to get at the uh, mass flux of water and the temperature. Uh, so we need the temperature and the pressure to get the density, and then with the density and the velocity, we get the mass flux. OK, so we, first we did this in our wind tunnel at Stanford in ambient, uh, ambient conditions. And here's the velocity that we got compared with the pitot tube measurement of velocity all the way down to practically zero meters per second. So what this shows is that we have the ability to measure uh, 
low levels of velocity, meters per second, all the way up to high speed. And I mentioned yesterday, I think it was yesterday, that we use the same concept in an electric propulsion device to measure 18 kilometers a second. So the nice thing about this idea is that it works over a very wide range of Doppler shifts at a precision of about half a meter per second when we really worked at it. This is not the best way to measure velocity at low speeds. This is just a confirmation that we know how to measure velocity. So that when we go to high speed, we have some confidence in it. So we went to NASA Langley, and the student uh, went to NASA Langley, and this was the so-called Direct Connect Supersonic Combustion Test Facility. So this is a system that's uh, designed for looking at uh, scramjet <coughs> engines. Here's the so-called combustor. Here's the isolator. So there's some sort of vitiated high temperature combustion, he, uh, combustion um, air with some water present uh, through a nozzle which expands it to supersonic velocities, an isolator section which is used for where we make our measurements and damps out some waves. Uh, here's where the fuel would be injected to study this combustor, and here's another diverging nozzle. So this would be a ground test facility to study uh, scramjet engines. It's called the Direct Connect Supersonic Combustion Test Facility at NASA Langley. The particular conditions they were running when we were there was a Mach 2.65 nozzle, which produced a static temperature of about 1,000 Kelvin and a pressure of about 0.7 atmospheres. And that simulates Mach 5 flight. So roughly speaking, the uh, local Mach number is, tends to be about a third, usually it's about a third, of the flight Mach number, at least it is at high Mach number. So the air, and of course in real life, the air is heated as it's coming in. So to simulate the combustion inlet, there's a different local Mach number than the flight Mach number. And so uh, the job for us was to take this isolator section, which was a couple feet long, rectangular, and to put some translation stages for the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. We put translation stages, actually the vertical this way and then the horizontal this way. So we put some translation stages on there because we have to move, we have to probe different parts of the flow uh, by moving our laser beams. And the goal was to measure velocity and temperature in the mass flux. So there's a picture now of the um, upstream window. Here's our translating sensors, downstream locations. So remember these beams are, are coming across uh, different locations axially. So they have to have an axial component to get the axial velocity. This was actually 2009. So we scanned across, looks something like that. We scanned across both directions. So the sensor probes both the vertical and horizontal planes. These are the dimensions of the, of the test section where we were making our measurements. We would take that uh, during those scans. Here's the vertical scan. It was about seven centimeters. And here's our data points compared with the CFD path average. So remember, we're making a path average. So we the right comparison is with the CFD path average simulation. Basically, there's some boundary layers here. We'll have to worry about. So that was good. But then we realized that one advantage that we hadn't really thought about was that because we can measure transients, we were actually able to see the startup of the tunnel, how well it performed well, and the turnoff, which was not something that the CFD people could do. So we can see these transients in the tunnel and also see velocities that agreed really well. Predicted velocity was 1630. We were measuring a really close number. So this fast sensor captures the startup transients in velocity and temperature. Okay, so that's just a quick view of telling you that, that these ideas can be developed in the university laboratory and taken to a national facility. We also had a, a campaign with our friends at the University of Virginia uh, where they have a vertical supersonic scramjet facility, uh, electrically heated, so this one would run for hours. And you can see all the plumbing that goes into a facility like this, plumbing of, of water and cooling and windows, and this is a side view. So if you see the flow coming this way, there'd be injection of fuel into this cavity. This is cavity flame holding, and there's the emission that we see from the combustor. Let's see what happens if I try this. Um, th there might be some sound. There probably isn't some sound. I don't think I hooked up the sound. Okay, you're not going to hear it. It basically makes a lot of noise. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> makes a lot of noise here. Unfortunately, you're not hearing it. Okay. 
Okay. Anyway, you have to be in another room. So this is a, you know, this is a dangerous uh, thing that they're running. It's running like on hydrogen fuel. Uh, and uh, hydrogen, uh, no, ethylene is the fuel, but hydrogen is used in the, in the, in the inlet stream. So this would be the side view of this. So flow's coming this way. It's a vertical tunnel. Here's the cavity. And there's fuel injection that's done here, and the combustion looks like it's in here. So this was an experiment where we used um, two lasers to get water and temperature. We used one laser to get CO and one laser to get CO2. And, you have to, and these were propagated by various kinds of fiber. Uh, this is called Zeblan fiber. Uh, and this is called holocore fiber. So there are ways to work even at long wavelengths through these fibers, although they're pretty fragile. So you collimate the light, you send it through. We call this the pitch side. Collimate the light, send it through, capture it, and then uh, send that signal to the detector and then interrogate it. I think this is the first use of fiber-coupled mid-IR, certainly for air applications. So we were really pushing the envelope for, for, um, for doing this at long wavelengths. For the most part, you can't buy fibers that work at long wavelengths. So we had to go to this uh, hollow core. But we, we did show that we could go out to about two and a half microns with this uh, kind of fiber, as long as the lengths weren't too high. Problem, it's a materials problem. The fiber has to transmit the, the wavelength. These are just some representative uh, information. If we, if we were looking right here across through the, through the uh, two-dimensional combustor, we measured uh, temperature using two lines of CO for a particular uh, JP020. Uh, okay, this is the vehicle's zero J20 transition, going zero to one, and 20 going to 19, and this is the vehicle's one. So we are actually measuring the population in the vehicle zero state and the vehicle's one state, which is very temperature sensitive because of the vibrational energy spacing is 3,000 degrees. So we now take the ratios and you get temperature in, in real time. And basically what we're interested in is how big are the fluctuations? How big are the fluctuations? And they were about, in this location, they were about 140 degrees. And we were trying to compare this with some uh, CFD simulations, which were path integrated. And the comparison of CO2 was pretty good. Um, now this is distance from the lower wall. So this is basically uh, uh, working your way out, working it this way. At position one and position two. So basically, the agreement is reasonably good, and the, the goal was to validate the CFD calculations being done at North Carolina. Pretty good agreement for the CO2. For some reason, the CO is not in good agreement. So here's the plot of the CO in this combustion zone uh, um, data and simulation. So they're off uh, quite a bit for this particular transition of CO. Don't understand why. But that's the value of doing experiments, trying to figure out what's wrong, either in the experiment or the, or the, or the code. Now, let's see. Back about uh, eight years ago, one of my students, Greg Rieker, that's the one who's at the professor at Colorado now, did an experiment at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I think that's called Tunnel 19. And, the idea, and he was really the first one in which we began to use like multiple lasers. He used four lasers. So he picked these colors. I'll tell you more about that in a second. And he passed them through single mode fiber. So he combined them into one fiber, propagated it into the pitch across the supersonic flow, collected that light, and dispersed it with a grating onto two detectors. And these uh, signals were modulated at different frequencies so they could be separated on these detectors. And he picked, he picked uh, two lines that are in one wavelength range and, and two that were in another wavelength range. And the idea being to measure two temperatures. He wanted to measure temperature by this line pair and temperature by this line pair, chosen so that one pair was sensitive to low temperatures and one pair was sensitive to high temperatures. And so now we plot the ones that are sensitive to high temperature, the green, versus time in seconds during the tunnel run. And what you see is that initially, we picked out a segment in which these two temperatures begin to differ. For a long time, they were equal, and suddenly the the high temperature lines grew and the low temperature lines uh, went down. The question is, why is this happening? So the idea, and so we wanted to understand this. And so the idea is that temperature has become non-uniform. Temperature was uniform because we get the same high and low temperature. Now the temperature is not uniform anymore. Something's happening in the tunnel. 
And so we wanted to look at this, and the way uh, Greg did this is he, he did a running F of T of these signals, and we looked at the low frequency content of each one and the high frequency content of each one. And over here, and what we found is that the ratio of the frequencies in these two colors uh, stayed about the same for the stable combustion case. And when this began to happen, uh, we began to see this, ratio, this change. So what we were doing is we were using frequency content of the low frequency fluctuations to indicate that the inlet was about to unstart in this combustion, basically it. So it was an optical way of uh, anticipating unstart in this combustion. Unstart's a phenomenon that, that they worry about in operating a scramjet. What's interesting here is that it's not just the absolute temperatures we care about, it's the frequency content. So sometimes it's just the frequency content of the signal that's telling you about some change. So notice that the, 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 it's the blue one that starts to get, become noisier than the, than the green one, basically, what we see. So this became a, a concept for control, which, and we did this in some laboratory combustors. We just look at frequency content to indicate that uh, when there is a, you, you could look for certain frequencies and feed that back to the fuel system to try to reduce instabilities. So looking at some future trends, I must be getting near the end, that's slide 36. So the, what I see now happening is that these systems are becoming portable. They're not limited to the laboratory anymore. They're useful for a wide range of aerospace applications, temperature, velocity, species, mass flux. And the students will load these up into three, four, five, six, seven suitcases and take them on the road. And I'm gonna show you some really big scale experiments uh, tomorrow. And properly designed, these systems are very robust. The lasers are robust. Uh, they're telecom kind of lasers. Uh, the fibers are robust. Typically, you have to control the temperature uh, of the lasers that they're in a conveniently or a comfortable temperature regime. Propagate the light by fiber, and you can do long-term monitoring of energy systems. I think I'll show you tomorrow a case where we actually left the lasers on for about a month. So it, it, what happens is we're seeing the transition between kind of science and engineering. We've done the science, we've learned how to make these measurements. Uh, it's time to package them up, go to a real facility. When you get there, you find out the problems are typically window design, cooling design, vibrations, engineering problems that you have to solve. And uh, that usually means you go back to the laboratory and you make some adjustment, maybe in the way you're modulating the lasers. I can see the, uh, this being used to control or maintain or control um, facility performance, emissions, flight systems. I've been talking here about um, mostly the mid-IR, but it's possible to do some of this in the UV as we try to access new species, a uh, variety of species. So you know you change the species, you've got to change the, change the absorption wavelength. We still don't have a good way to measure molecular hydrogen or molecular nitrogen, however. So I believe these, uh, this will lead to more research opportunities in energy and propulsion. And it's what I'm going to do tomorrow. Well, maybe I'm going to come back. I think I moved the IC engines to here. Okay, I'm going to show you IC engines tomorrow. A coal slagging coal gasifier, which is really a hard project. A coal gasifier, uh, one was at, uh, this is the National Carbon, Coal Carbon Capture. This is, this is a big thing down in Alabama. Uh, We've done this in a full scale, full, uh, scale 1.2 gigawatt um, power, power generating system. So basically you're seeing the, um, what I'm trying to show you is there's the fundamentals we've talked about for days. And now we're going to see real applications. And the good news for a lot of this dial laser stuff is that you don't have to, the spectroscopy is a lot simpler. You just use Hytran and some other quantities that we measure in the laboratory. It's much, much simpler. Okay, I think that's it. So, any questions? No questions. Yes. Well, you collect data in the wavelength range that you scan. You usually, if your goal is nitric oxide, we take our knowledge of the NO spectrum 
and our knowledge of the water is usually a big problem. And we find a place, we find windows where it's only NO. Sometimes you can find a window that's NO and, C, uh, NO and water and we'll scan and we'll get both. We're not doing emission. In emission, these spectra are all overlapped and complicated. But by being spectrally narrow, we can find a window. We can find places. And that part of the research is to find a place to measure NO in the presence of water. Because water is everywhere. But we can do that. Yes? If you find an asymmetry in, uh, for instance, the second harmonic of yes. the WMS yes. signal, yep. is that a physical we do. property or is that an experimental error? Uh, both. I mean, you have to be careful. It's, it's, a, it's a property of the experiment. I wouldn't call it error. I think we, we understand why this should be present. Okay. And so uh, you might think the first order is going to be symmetric, but there's reasons why it's not symmetric. Okay. The line shape is symmetric. E even when the line shape is symmetric, the fact that the laser intensity is changing, you, you can get so into this can problem. You can be accounted for. But so when you first see it, you know, oh, something's wrong. But no, it's actually right. You just, okay. yes. Because if, if you're trying to get the axial velocity, the perpendicular beam has no Doppler shift. So you just have to take the delta. So by measuring the, so you don't have to make an absolute frequency measurement. You only want to make a differential frequency measurement. So you do the scan of the line without a shift, compare it with the line with the shift. But now instead of doing that, if you take a forward and a reverse beam, you get double the signal for the same number of beams. So that's kind of a clever way to, to get more signal. The bigger the angle, the better. So the example that I think I showed early on was if we looked at an arc jet, we bring the light right up the tunnel. That way you get the maximum shift. If you're worried about there being two, uh, two components, now you've got to use a couple of different angles. So we're only getting, you only get one component with one beam. So you, two beams you can get, you get a second component. Yes. In the first case, why do you need the per per perpendicular beam? Because the perpendicular beam, uh, because you want to measure delta, delta frequency. You don't want to measure absolute frequency. You want to measure frequency difference. So, so you scan, you get the absorption line for no Doppler shift and the absorption line with the Doppler shift, and the difference is the is the is the Doppler shift. But if you knew the frequency of the laser you're using. Ah, but see, that's the problem. So now you have to say, do I? How well do I know it? And so you don't want to measure the wavelength. You want to measure delta wavelength, much, much more sensitive. That's how we were able to get down to meters per second. Now, if you're doing this at uh, kilometers per second, well, then you, you don't actually have to have the, the, the reference beam. It's only when you're really trying to measure uh, small Doppler shifts that it's better to measure delta, delta frequency than an absolute frequency. You can buy wave meters that give you the absolute frequency, but not accurate enough. So it's just very simple, take one beam and so sometimes we'll pass one beam through through room air. And then the other be, and then through the through the uh, through the experiment. So we get them in one beam sometimes. We can do that too. So but it's such a powerful idea. Uh, but it is a path average. But you know, when you're doing running a tunnel, people actually want uniform flow. It's it's pretty uniform. And if you have CFD to take care of the boundary layers and one thing you have to do is if you're going to go through a, a boundary layers that are cold or hot. Boundary layers are cold in most heated facilities, but they actually can be hot in a, hotter than the core gas in a supersonic facility. You always want to be sure you're not sensitive to the, that temperature range. So if it's a cold layer, you do not want to pick low J lines because they'll, be over, they'll, be over, they'll overwhelm the core. If you want to measure the core where it's hot, you want to pick lines that are not sensitive to cold. That's a common mistake that people make. So if there's non-uniformity in your flow, you have to be careful. Yes? Could the presence of other species uh, influence the dipole moment and hence make yes, the yes. So the broadening, So the broadening depends on the mixture. So for example, we know that if we have a CO line, it's broadened more by water than it is by CO. So you have to do kind of a mole fraction sum if you want to measure the shape. But if you're only going to measure, but you can get around the, not, the need to know the shape by integrating over the line. Remember, that gives us the line strength, sensitive only to the number density. So it's, line shape is, is an opportunity 
and a problem. We get rid of the problem by doing the integral. But we use the opportunity to measure other things, like temperature, pressure. But if you're going to do that, you need to know the contributions of the broadening and even the shift to the mixture. But frequently, you know, you can represent the mixture by three or four things. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah.